folks. With this video, we are starting a new series. We will be bringing surprise boxes from time to time. Open them and look inside. Here we go, box number one. It happened to be a small collection of coins, mostly those that have animals depicted on them. It's actually amazing how many different animals have their images on coins. Look, this one is from Iceland and has an image of a flying squid. Just imagine, a squid that can fly! A bull, one of the four protector spirits of Iceland, is on the other side. 10 RR is like 10 cents. New Zealand has a kiwi bird on the 20 cents and on the dollar coins. People in Peru see llamas on their coins all the time. Clearly, each country has its favorite animals. Look at this cute pig on one cent from Bermuda. Another coin from the same country. Here is a charming echidna from Australia. I love this creature. It lays eggs but feeds its offspring with milk like a mammal. Its long snout can sense electrical signals from the prey hiding underground. Echidna eats ants, termites, and worms. It has long claws to dig and long spines for protection. It can curl into a ball like a hedgehog would do. Another example of undeniable cuteness is an image of a feather tail glider on one cent from Australia. This creature is also called the flying mouse. Its tail looks like a feather, but the animal glides by stretching the skin between its legs. This tiny creature, less than three inches long, is the world's smallest gliding mammal and a right choice for the one cent coin. Singapore put lionfish on the 50 cents coin. It's been a while after 1974, and by now, lionfish have become an invasive species in the North Atlantic. It preys on the algae eaters, leading to algae overgrowth and destruction of coral ecosystems in Florida, the Gulf of Mexico, and the Caribbean. This is an interesting silver coin made in Mexico. Eight reales with lifelike eagle holding a snake with one leg while balancing with another on an apuntia cactus. It's a large and heavy coin. Look, it has markings. They are called chop marks and were likely made by Chinese bankers. Those people treated silver coins not like currency but rather as a piece of precious metal and they put stamps on coins using metal punches similar to Europeans making hallmarks on the silverware as a sign of the authenticity of the item. This practice also helped to recognize counterfeit coins that were silver plated. Very cool stuff, showing that this coin was traveling around the world on a sail ship and was handled by many different people. Which coin do you think is the cutest one ever? Write a comment and also let me know if you'd like the idea of curiosity boxes. I want to know your opinion. Do not forget to subscribe to see our next video. And good luck! Hi! Are you ready for another curiosity box? Well, let's open this one and see what's inside. It looks like an ancient effigy jar. But, for full disclosure, it is most likely not authentic. It's just an old reproduction, made in style, known as Casas Grandes. Ceramic vessels like this one were made by Native Americans sometime between the 12th and 15th century AD. People of Casas Grandes live on the territory of modern-day North Mexico in huge, multi-room adobe buildings. Casa means house in Spanish, and grande is large. The giant adobe houses resemble the structure we saw in Wapatki National Monument near the Grand Canyon. 
But the bricks used to build the walls were made of sun-dried mud and gravel. The place also had sophisticated water usage system that delivered water to certain rooms, stored it in reservoirs, and removed waste. The Casas Grandes is actually the name of the archaeological site, which is thought to belong to Mogollon culture. Decorated effigy jars are what they are famous for. People who made Casas Grandes pottery were quite creative in converting real life into symbols. It's intriguing to observe how ancient people explored the virtual world of ideas in their art, and to try to decipher their views of the universe. The decorations on the pottery usually made in white, brown, and black. They often incorporate so-called lightning pattern, the white zigzag line. However, it's not meant to symbolize lightning, but rather is profile of a multi-story communal house. I would even say that it resembles the staircases of Mayan pyramids. This is how I imagine the pattern was seen by people who lived in Casas Grandes. This guy has his eyes closed, indicating the state of trance or hallucination often induced by smoking and practiced by shamans when they ventured into other worlds. Did you know that there is a legend describing mammoths as fairy tale creatures used by shamans to ride into underground world? Notice the decoration on the hand of this figure. It reminds me of ceremonial body paintings. How do I know that it's a guy? Well, the specific details of Casas Grande's effigy jars, representing male or female, usually make it obvious. But in our case, it's hard to tell, unless you are aware that sitting female figures usually have their legs extended and straight while male figures sit in a squatting position with their legs bent. Based on this distinction, it has to be a man, who is daydreaming with closed eyes, traveling in the world of imagination, possibly under the influence, so to speak. By the way, while we are discussing the real cultural trends, let's not forget that it is a recent imitation piece. The style resembles those called Ramos Polychrome, and via ahumada polychrome. The pottery was covered with a gray liquid clay or silt and the designs were painted using brushes made from yucca fibers. A cool thing about pottery in general is that it's like stone, stays basically forever. A thousand year old piece may look like it's new. Who knows who will be holding this vessel in a few hundred years from now but it has a chance to be preserved for a long, long time. My parents bought this vessel at an antique store in Texas and used it for stage photography, but nothing got published, as far as I know. So, it's a debut for this little guy. Welcome him with our likes, and do not forget to subscribe to be with us next time when we will open another curiosity box. Bye-bye! Hi everyone! It's time for another curiosity box. Let's see what's inside of this one. These are dry pods of alfarobera or carob tree, which is known for two things. Number one, the pods can be used as a substitute for chocolate in multiple foods. Number two, the name of the carob tree is the origin of the word carrot a traditional unit of measure for the weight of precious gemstones. Carrot, or metric carrot to be precise, was officially adopted as a weight unit for precious stones in 1907, but it was long used by merchants who put diamonds on one cup of a balance and the carob seeds on another. Naturally, first thing we wanted to do once we got a hold of the specimens is to check their weight. One carrot, which, by the way, is spelled with a C, not a K like for the gold purity unit, corresponds to 0 0.2 grams or 200 milligrams. The weight of four seeds we recovered from one of the pods was 716 milligrams or 179 milligrams per seed. Pretty close, but still a bit under. I think that there must have been some kind of sorting were unusually small, underdeveloped seeds were discarded before the rest was used as weighted standard. We are done with diamonds for now. 
Let's talk about carob tree as a food source. This is how the carob tree looks like. This one is a female version, and there are also male trees as well. It naturally grows in the Mediterranean region. The traditional chocolate is made from the pods of a cocoa tree. The pods of a carob tree can also be turned into powder, which has a sweet taste and low fat content. From what I was able to find online, Carob candy bars are made with addition of palm oil and natural sweeteners, like agave or barley malt. The nutritional value comes with the abundance of soluble fiber. It seems like the easiest way to add carob powder to your diet is to mix it into a smoothie or add it to cookies. Let me know if you ever tasted food with carob powder and how did you like it? All right, from my experience, Breaking down these tough pods is not easy and could be discouraging. Next time, I'll probably find a commercial product online. The main producers of carob pods are Portugal, Spain, Italy, and Morocco. It's also traditionally used as animal food, particularly for donkeys. Also, as a disclaimer, we do not recommend to use it or not to use it. It's your decision. Do your research and consult with the doctor before you buy or eat anything new. You can never know what kind of natural compounds the plants can produce, and some plants can make nasty stuff. The connection between purity of gold and carrot as a weight unit comes from Romans. They were making gold coins that weighed as much as 24 carob tree seeds, and this is why 24 karat gold is pure gold. Thanks for watching! Visit our channel again sometime and have fun exploring nature, but be safe! We are back with a new curiosity box, and this time it's a small collection of gourd carvings. I'm convinced that gourds were one of the first vessels ever used, and that the form of primitive clay pods was just a copy of nature's design. Next time you take a round tea cup in your hands, Remember that the origins of its shape go back to the time when people were growing their own tableware on a patch of land, together with squash, potato, beans, and other veggies. Not a bad idea, by the way, and perhaps one day we will do it again. Forward-thinking people are already experimenting with growing furniture and bricks from fungi. Considering the long history of using gourd vessels, it's natural that gourd carving has been practiced in many countries for thousands of years. This particular bottle gourd was made in Kenya. In Africa, dried bottle gourds are known as calabashes. Calabash is the name of the tree that produces hollow fruits, which are also popular as utensils. So, the word calabash can be confusing. Still, both the bottle gourds and fruits of the calabash tree are very common food containers and are used for other purposes, including as resonators for musical instruments. Fruits of the calabash tree are large and can be used for large bowls and even as hats by the women of a tribe in Cameroon. The dry gourds are yellow and they are darkened by staining when a gourd is being rubbed with millet leaves or just smoked. Sometimes a scraping knife is used to carve out the design and is heated in the fire right before carving. This also can create differences in coloration. Famous Peruvian gourds usually depict everyday scenes from life of the mountain people. This one has llamas, a woman in a traditional hat, a house, and lots of stars. Stargazing in those mountains is incredible because of the elevation in dry air. The design is done by scraping the darkened surface. Our next decorated gourd can be attributed to the style, which was originated in Lanzhou region of China and dates back to the Qing dynasty. Very often, Lanzhou gourds are tiny, almost like a tennis ball. Those are called egg gourds. Long ago, 
Large gourds with the inscriptions meaning medicine served as door signs for pharmacies. The carvings, or rather scrapings, on the gourds were also used to identify the content of the containers. There is more. Crickets were common pets in China, and the homes for little critters were often made from gourds. It looks like one of the drawings depicts a boy with a cage, perhaps feeding a bird or a cricket. Others look like they play music with tambourines. The landscape elements are clearly drawn in traditional Chinese style. These three boys play table game that looks like yi or wei qi, which is an early version of chess. I really like the details in these miniature drawings. Calligraphy, which was done with a needle, is exquisite, and the traditional red stamp of a master is present. I wish I knew what the inscription means, but my Chinese is not good enough for that. Please leave a comment if you can translate it. Hand-painted gourds represent the more recent art, and people can get really creative when it comes to decorating gourds. Check online and you will be surprised by how many different styles exist. All decorative gourds have to be cured in a well-ventilated space, and sometimes they are also being shaped in different forms. But it has to be done very, very early when the tiny gourd is young, green, and susceptible to meddling. People grow bottle gourds for around 11,000 years, not for food at all, but as vessels to store and carry liquids. Fascinating and ingenious. I love the concept of growing your own bottle. In addition to keeping water in gourds, Native Americans use them as birdhouses or for making rattles. Hollow gourds make cool sounds. This one sounds the best of all four gourds we have. The gourds are good for brewing, for making honeycombs, for storing crops, or to measure the crops, and so on. You get the idea. Thanks for watching. Stay curious. Bye.